City Council. We have a forum. Item 3 or for items for, for review and discussion. Item 3A is the Department of Community Development. 3A1 is a presentation of proposed sewer master plan. Mr. McMurray. Valentine's Day, Mr. McMurray. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, this evening I have our consultant, uh, Burke Murph with GWES. He has um, come here to speak on sewer master planning, which is very exciting for the city as we need the growth uh, of sewer and uh, sewer trunk lines going to our new wastewater plan. Um, Burke? Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. I appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, we have uh, completed a draft of the sewer master plan uh, as a planning document for the city to take forward in making some important decisions about developing the road uh, and the infrastructure that will be needed for that. Uh, on the screen, as you can see, is the limits of our study. Um, as you all know and are very well aware, the eastern service area of the city is um, currently unserved by sewer, and there is a need there as development will uh, continue to push toward the east of the city's uh, current infrastructure. Uh, getting into this project, um, we we're asked to also take a look at the city's south service area, which is currently served um, by uh, the Satterfield Water Pollution Control Plant. Um, due to recent development in the south, uh, specifically along, along the South Perry Parkway, uh, there is a need to take a look at what will be required of the city as growth continues to come. And this was in conjunction with the city's um, update of the service area boundary, which will be everything north of Flat Creek. Um, that was recently done uh, by the city uh, in the fall of last year, I believe. And so this was all incorporated into a master plan, uh, specifically for growth and the needs of sewer development uh, that the city will be confronted with here in, in the near future. I would like to point out that the master plan is based on a 30-year planning period. So I want to be very clear with that, that uh, the city will has a plan moving forward as development comes and is anticipated. And that will be phased over a period of time, up to 30 years, as development continues to grow uh, throughout parts of the city. So really wanted to, to point that out and and focus uh, our efforts over that 30-year period. <clears throat> As you see on the next slide is a little bit closer view of the city's south service area. Um, currently the south uh, really is served um, by development that is uh, east of Highway 41 and uh, along South Perry Parkway. There's one pump station, Highway 41 South Pump Station, that currently serves existing development. And due to a lot of interest in the area, this was one of those issues that uh, came along as we started our initial study and was asked to, what do we do in the uh, event that our current system doesn't have the capacity to provide sewer for future development in this area? And so that's what we uh, focused uh, our efforts on. The south service area, as defined uh, by the city, is roughly about 6,500 acres. Now, this is not all developable. It does have waters of the state and some wetland boundaries. There's probably some areas of uh, conservation that, uh, that would prohibit development of some type, possibly. But ultimately, it is a large service area, and the majority of that service area is not currently served 
by sewer. And so we took this into account as, as we were planning how are we going to uh, get sewer to this area or increase capacity of existing facilities so that development can occur. And again, this is over a period of time. But ultimately, what, uh, what our study suggested is uh, the existing facilities that are within the city now that currently serve the South Service area and go flow to uh, the Satterfield Water Pollution Control Plant uh, will reach their capacity in the near future and this area uh, will exceed that capacity as development comes. So how will we overcome that? And, the ultimate alternative is to divert this flow from Satterfield to the proposed East Perry Wastewater Treatment Facility. And so that's how uh, we focused our efforts on how will we phase uh, sewer infrastructure to accommodate growth responsibly as well as uh, in terms of, of capacity and planning for the future. The next slide that we have shows all of the sub-basins and phases of development <clears throat> that may occur and how we will get infrastructure to those uh, particular areas. And so as you can see with the colorful lines and the shaded areas, these are all the sub-basins that are in the south and ultimately uh, what we hope to do, let me see if I can get this working properly. Show uh, Chad, he'll show where the east uh, wastewater treatment plant site will be. Thank In this area here will be the east uh, where we're planning. This is out near Purdue off of the Highway 247 spur. So this would be uh, where we're referring to this area. And so, what we need for the wastewater treatment plant to operate is flow. So, we will need to get flow to the plant. And in doing that, we can also serve the south service area through a couple of phases of sewer infrastructure. Um, as you can see on the chart, the red line would be considered uh, phase one and the green line would be considered phase two. Now phase two is necessary to serve the South Perry Parkway area, Highway 41 and South Pump Station. So to be able to accommodate development in that particular area along South Perry Parkway, uh, the city would have to not only do the red uh, line infrastructure shown, but also the green. The red will ultimately take uh, Perry Parkway pump station off of the Satterfield uh, plant and send that flow to the uh, new East Perry wastewater treatment plant. And then furthermore, as development grows to the south, Highway 41 pump station would be eliminated and all of that flow with gravity feed down to the new wastewater treatment plant. There are other phases potentially as over again this 30 year period, uh, as development occurs in the city service area, these phases would be incorporated on an as needed basis uh, to accommodate that growth. So uh, there's no crystal ball. We don't know what the future holds. This master plan is truly what, what it is. It is planning for the future of growth and how uh, it can be done in a responsible manner to accommodate development. And so uh, ultimately uh, phases three and four can be done when it is absolutely necessary, when growth has reached that limit. And so uh, four ultimate phases on South Perry Clark Way, but uh, to really get the plant operating, we really need to proceed 
with the phase one, which will get the immediate uh, flow to the plant um, and, and is uh, the highest priority of our, of our infrastructure uh, planning uh, is, that, is that phase one. But again, as growth on South Bay Parkway occurs, we will need to tie in um, all the way up to Highway 41 South Pump Station and eliminate that pump station and grab the feed down to the plant. Thank you, Chad. Uh, moving along to the east service area. As you can see uh, with the little uh, blue color there, that, that is where your east period wastewater treatment plant is located and will be served. Um, roughly there are uh, 1,700, uh, excuse me, 17,500 acres of land in the east service area, but um, after you take out conservation, after you take out uh, wetlands and streams and, and boundaries, things like that, we're looking at about uh, 8,500 acres of developable land. So uh, that in itself is, is, a, is a very large number. Uh, but uh, this plant will be able to accommodate both the east and south uh, uh, service areas for the city and possibly even beyond that. Uh, we were notified earlier uh, this morning I believe, I think it was this morning or Friday afternoon, excuse me, that EPD will have the waste of allocation request back to the city, hopefully by the end of the month, which will ultimately start the permitting process for the new East Ferry wastewater treatment facility. So uh, we are trying to keep our schedule as much as we possibly can. When we started out on this endeavor, we were hoping that the permitting period would be complete in 12 to 18. So uh, we are in uh, month 13. So we're getting, we're, we're staying on course and ultimately we want to uh, keep that schedule on track for to be completed with the permitting in July of this year. Looking at the east service area, a little more complicated than the south. A lot of, of basins that uh, possibly may require uh, sewer, but again, I, I really want to focus on this is a 30-year plan, and it will be phased over time as the need occurs. So those, were, those will be decisions that will be made by city staff and yourselves on what your focus should primarily be. Um, currently, you are already under or have taken on phase one of your uh, expansion for the east service area. And that is along Calvin Road. There's a project called the Bear Branch Sewer Expansion, Phase 1A, and that was to uh, provide uh, immediate sewer uh, to development along Calvin Road. I have a, a scheduled update from the contractor that is working on that project. Um, he will be finished installing the pipeline in approximately three weeks, weather depending and uh, we'll be up and running ready to accept sewer uh, pretty much by March. I mean, we're, we're getting close. Uh, phase 1B, well, he will start on immediately after, and that is the uh, gravity sewer on the back side um, that will be running up to the new elementary school, and that will be completed in July. So uh, with all the weather that we've had, with um, some of the, the unknowns that we've been challenged with, uh, project, on schedule and, and uh, has, has been good good to date. A few hiccups, but um, nothing that couldn't be overcome with the help of city staff. So uh, that is phase one. Phase two would be uh, getting uh, Perry Parkway off of, uh, Perry Parkway Pump Station, excuse me, off of Satterfield. I mentioned that in the south service area, the highest priority which is shown in green on your map, that will feed down to the new plant. So the, what you can take away from this is these uh, phase improvements will be done in conjunction with one another. So you have to do phase one in the east and, and complement that with phase one in the south. 
uh, and that, that is ultimately to bring that flow to the new wastewater treatment plant to keep it um, operating from day one. Um, from that point, moving forward, phase two would be running up uh, to along Mossy Creek, up to the Talton Road sewer, take the uh, interim pump station that is currently being installed offline, and everything will gravity flow. That'll take Wind River subdivision and a majority of the flow in your north service area off of Satterfield and bringing it down to the new plant. There is a uh, a subpart to all of this, which is important to put out. As we're taking capacity from the south and the east north and taking it to our new wastewater treatment plant, it is freeing up capacity at Satterfield, which is extremely important because there's other development that is occurring in your west and in your north service areas that will have no choice but to uh, flow to Satterfield in a responsible manner. So uh, the, there are benefits to the city of, of having a new wastewater treatment plant and diverting flow as it opens up capacity within the system that you already currently have. So I, I did want to, to make sure that that was understood. Just like the South Service area, there are other phases that will occur over this long period of time as the need arises and growth occurs. So. We don't know if that's going to be 30 years or 10 years, but for the planning purposes, this was to be uh, phased out over a 30 year period. So, the question becomes what, what are the next steps? Well, we've um, had a meeting with the city staff to review the master plan. It was a draft copy. We have received comments. We are updating master plan per those comments and uh, we'll be ready to issue that um, when the city gives us the, the thumbs up to do so. Um, we are proceeding as your program manager, uh, owner's representative if you will, in soliciting an engineer of record to design the wastewater treatment plan. We will also uh, begin the solicitation process for a construction manager at risk to build your wastewater treatment plant. That is currently uh, the path that we have been given. Based on the master plan, um, next steps, what do we need to do? Well, these uh, sewer trunk mains in the south and the east, they, uh, that it's gonna take some time. Lots of property acquisition is necessary. We need to understand the alignment of those sewer lines. We need to perform the environmental delineation work to make sure that we are uh, not causing any harm to the environment, staying out of stream buffers and wetlands. We need to determine a, an alignment for, for the sewer uh, infrastructure that will be installed and ultimately uh, determine how much uh, land needs to be acquired as part of the construction of, of these lines. Uh, we do not at this time have to proceed with any design or any permitting per se, but uh, it, it will be coming up fairly quickly. Uh, the goal that we have been given is to have the new wastewater treatment plant online by January of 2026. So that's four years away. So in that time, we will need to construct the new wastewater treatment plant and we will need to install the infrastructure necessary to bring flow to the new plant so it can operate. So summarizing the next steps um, as far as your gravity sewer trunk mains is to proceed with determining an alignment, performing the environmental delineations, and assisting the city in land acquisition uh, for proper construction of those facilities. Any questions? Questions, council members? It's a very in-depth review of our long-range needs in the city. And <clears throat> we know those are coming at us very quickly because you can ride around in the south or the east or the northwest and see 
brand new subdivisions being built out. I'm amazed at the number of subdivisions that have been completed in the last 60 to 90 days. And so uh, a lot of construction going on. So this is something that we're going to have to address very quickly. Mr. Gilmore, what do you need from council? Uh, well, since we weren't overwhelmed with questions from council on this particular project, uh, other than maybe sitting stunned, uh, it would be my recommendation uh, that at your meeting tomorrow, we will have a resolution for you adopting this uh, sewer master plan for these two service areas, and then we'll go from there relative to the planning and the scheduling. And as we go through the planning and scheduling, all of the details will be brought back to council for final approval. Before. Absolutely, yes. You know, as, as we go to bid, as we build sections of this over the, I don't think I'll be here 30 years from now, but over the next 20 years, say, um, the council will be the person who makes the decision on the bid, accepting the bids and those type things, and the actual expenditures. Yes, that would be, you may remember being quite similar to what was done with the Bear Branch project that was referenced. Remember, we were back to you relative right away. We were back to you relative to uh, bids that came in from the construction. We were back to you about how that was going to be funded. And that would be the same with the, the whole process. Council members, do you have any questions about this process? The Bear okay. Branch is, is, we've done all the land acquisition for, for Bear Branch. Yes, it's, it's all, it's all we're, we're all done with that, more or less. Yeah, the pipe's going in the ground right now. We're, yes. I had a call from the developer wanting to know um, if we were, how far away were we? And I said, well, I don't know that it's real sensitive since you don't have a house under construction yet. So, but um, we got our part done, and we're ready to accept sewer from them well ahead of the time that they'll have houses up in in place, and so, yeah, that, that's all been done. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Murphy, I can thank you and the staff here for the work that you've done. I've watched you guys put this together, and I know there's been a numerous, or there have been numerous changes to this as we kind of thought about what what is the right thing to do for the next 30 years, and so on really compliment your willingness to be flexible and look at alternatives as we move forward to this project. So, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And so we'll have a resolution tomorrow to approve the sewer plan as presented. That's the plan that most councils agree with. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Item 3B is the office of the city manager. 3B1 is Foresight Group, a presentation on leveraging federal dollars for broadband infrastructure. Ms. Harden. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I have two guests this evening. We have Lee Comer, um, he's out of Birmingham, Alabama, and we have Doug Stoner, they're with the Foresight Group. And um, just as we look at sewer planning, um, broadband is um, looked at as infrastructure, and this is an informational session this evening. We don't have a request. Uh, we just want to inform you guys of what other cities in Georgia and other communities from around the country are doing regarding broadband um, community assessments and planning, um, especially as we look at more remote workers and just the landscape of technology. Um, if you all watched the Super Bowl commercials last night, I'm sure that you saw some broadband and 5G commercials as well as electric vehicle commercials. So we just know that technology is the face of the future and we have them from the Foresight Group for a presentation for you this evening. Thank you. So uh, I want to thank you for inviting us to come down and talk about this critical infrastructure just as much as sewer. Just real quickly, uh, I'm Doug Stoner. I am actually out of our lab office. Foresight is based in Peace Street Corner, so we're here. We're a Georgia-based company. Uh, Lee Comer here behind me. It's head of our broadband pact, a practice based in Birmingham, Alabama. We have about 16 offices around the country. But again, we're based here in, here in uh, Georgia. Just a little bit about myself before we kind of get started here. And again, this is informational. And this is something we're doing in lots of cities, uh, both here in Georgia, and counties, and other entities around the country. Um, uh, the 
reason we're here in Perry today is uh, twofold. Actually, Lee and I had gone down to the Georgia Economic Development Association's conference in Savannah last fall, and uh, I ran into your director, excuse me, your economic development administrator uh, down at the conference because we were down there talking to folks about this critical piece of infrastructure, you know, particularly around economic development and how critical it is for communities. And uh, I uh, ran into Ashley and we started talking and the reason we started having a conversation, I'm a property owner here in Perry, by the way. Uh, my uh, family, we own properties and just happen to be, we own them with the GameStop. It's out there near the Walmart. We've had that piece of property since 2003. So I'm a taxpayer here in the city and been involved and aware of Perry. Also, I'm a former state senator and state rep. I used to serve uh, Representative Walker. He used to sit in front of me in the Georgia House back in the days. I've actually testified in front of his son in the Georgia Senate uh, in the past. So I have connections here in Perry. So it was very interesting talking with her and obviously uh, understanding this community here and the growth that y'all are seeing. And it's something, obviously, I've been able to watch over the years because obviously we own a piece of property here. But this issue, this infrastructure, just like we're talking about sewer, it is, it is equal and supported to you as sewer or electrical grid or a road network uh, or a water system. All these issues, and it's becoming more so and so, especially since the pandemic. And I think it's made it very acute and aware for those communities who are prepared. So what, I'm going to ask Lee Conner to step up here and start talking about exactly how critical this is for communities, how we're talking to communities. An example, recently we've been working with the city of Tucker, the city of Sugar Hill, Forsyth County, just to name a few real quickly here in Georgia. Um, and Lee can talk about what we've done in other parts of the country too with other communities uh, similar to your size and your background and other types of uh, organizations. But uh, again, the point of all this is it's the informational it's for y'all for us to present this, but also explain to you the opportunities you have as a community, uh, in the sense of additional dollars that are out there, how to leverage those. So that's also for helping communities understand the opportunities now with what the federal government has passed from the infrastructure bill, or as it's called IIJA, Infrastructure Investment Job and Job Act. Just in case you get that piece of acronym down now, IIJA. Of course, y'all know what ARPA is and how those may work together to help y'all. And then finally, just you know, I'm used to being in your shoes. I used to be a city councilman in Smyrna too, so. Understand the challenges and decisions y'all work with yourself. So I'm going to stop there at this point. I'm going to let Lee Comer step up and let you kind of present the presentation. Thank you very much for having us tonight. Again, my name is Lee Comer. I'm the practice area leader for the broadband engineering team at Foresight Group. I'll tell you a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we're a little bit different than a lot of engineering companies in that we do have civil and structural landscape architecture, transportation. We've had wireless within the organization since we began in 2003, but my team came over in 2015, and so from the broadband engineering, you can kind of think of that as the fiber guys. Um, I came from AT&T, was there for 18 years, grew up in the Bell system, so once you get into the telecommunication system, you don't get out of it. Um, grew up in it, have seen the way it's evolved over the past decades. A few years ago, realized we needed to do something different. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, do you have an issue with the telcos? And the answer to that is no, they just have a very different business model. And you have to appreciate that. So as I go through this presentation tonight, I want to touch on that just a little bit. Let's talk about the different ways to look at telecommunications. As Doug had said, we've got offices across the U.S. Uh, I've done everything from small developments, private developments, resorts, uh, big NFL cities. Uh, we've designed thousands of miles of fiber optic networks, so I've seen a little bit of everything. Within our organization, we have a goal statement, and I try to share this as much as possible because it's critically meaningful to us. What we're doing is not about just doing a project, getting paid for it, and moving on to the next thing. We realize we're going into communities, we're going to change communities fundamentally. So we have a bit of a, a burden that comes into play with that. There's some ownership and responsibility. So our goal is to connect people to information, to ideas, and to other people. And we've been sharing that information with people for the last few years. And I love that your logo is where Georgia comes together because that represents the same mentality. So when I talk about telecommunications, you typically think of the old rotary handset telephone. I like to think of broadband connectivity as a little bit of a different term. 
So what is a connected community? Right now, because of COVID, a lot of the buzz has been about, hey, I need to work from home, I need to have internet access at home for homework, and that's been the focal point. And from that perspective, it's great that people are finally realizing the inadequacies that they've been dealing with. But it's not just about internet connectivity. All of these topics on here, these are all things that require broadband connectivity. Now, what else is interesting about this, if you find something in here that you connect with, this is something that's going to enhance the quality of life that you're living right now. These also help to ensure the business model is functional because they're points of revenue within the network. <coughs> so as you begin to look at this, you know, some questions you may have is, who's in charge of this? The telcos? Is this a role that government should be taking over? Who are the new players in the game? How does this work? And what is the process? And I wanted to kind of touch on a few of those things tonight just to let you see how we're dealing with this across the nation right now. So fundamentally, there are four parts of a broadband program. There's the network owner, there's a network operator, there's a service provider, and that can be multiple, and then there are consumers. Historically, the telecommunication companies did the first three collectively. So you, even with your, your bill right now, you're bundling everything. Well, they've bundled these services as well. They design them, they pay for them, they build them, they take care of them, they provide service, they do everything. And for the last hundred years, it's been really great. And America got connected through this system. But it needs to evolve a little bit. The screen I showed you just a few moments ago with all those different services, that's getting back to the concept of a true open access network. And it does require some level of separation in the different areas and the parts of the program. Now this is just a graphic if you're more of a visible person. Just kind of showing you how this is put together. So if you look at the far right, those are the consumers, the subscribers. And they may be using different services, whether it's telehealth, um, security system, some kind of utility switching and monitoring, lots of different services across the same network going to different kinds of service providers that feed their way back to an operator, and then that goes back to the network owner. So those four parts, I'm going to break that down just a little bit further. So the network owner, you're hearing the word infrastructure like you've never heard it before. And you may hear that you know, broadband is the fourth utility. What we're saying is, just like roads and water, gas, sidewalks, this is another infrastructure aspect. Now, we're talking about conduit, fiber, pieces of equipment, antennas, those kinds of infrastructure things. All that big list of services, a lot of those already exist today. That's not the future. It exists now. But if you don't have the proper infrastructure, none of those things will be supported in the work. So the network owner is dealing with the infrastructure. And that person funds the network, owns the network, has to understand the capex and opex within the infrastructure management. And it can look a lot of different ways. It can be completely privately owned, publicly owned, or really we kind of think a P3, a public-private partnership is the best way to address this. Now getting back to the telcos, what's their role in this? They have a much shorter return on investment scheme because they have stock holders they have to report to. But in this case, we're looking at an ROI that's you know, somewhere upwards of 20 years. That's a long time for an ROI, but if you think about this as an infrastructure investment, when you built a water system or a highway system, you had that same mentality in mind. The network operator. This is the team that comes in and takes care of the network. And that could include uh, a guy with a truck who rolls out and fixes a cut fiber, or does a new installation, or somebody who's running a network operational center monitoring that network. And this is the person who connects the service providers to the network owner. I'll get into that just a little bit further. But I do want to take a moment to talk about the service providers. Today, we typically think of that as an internet service provider. And on your bill, you may see it broken down into TV or video, internet, and phone service. So those are three kinds of services. But a service can be just about any kind of service. And that service provider will pay an access fee to the operator who manages that network for the owner. Those bottom bullets there, I think that's interesting to look into. 
Because as you start to look at the way the business model is beginning to unfold, it's going to look a lot different. So again, right now, we're really heavily thinking about internet access. And you'll hear words like access, meaning is there fiber there, is there internet there, availability, can I afford it, and adoption. Are people actually using it appropriately? But before you can get into that, you start looking at an ISP as an internet service provider. Well, we coined the term XSP, or X could be any other kind of barrier. It's not internet-based services. So if you have utility switching, that's not going to go across the internet. Um, telemedicine. And when I say telemedicine, you've probably heard the phrase telehealth, which is a, a FaceTime or a, uh, a web conferencing where you have video and voice. Well, telemedicine is a whole other aspect of that. It's where you're doing remote uh, dispensation of medicine or remote sensing. It's much more interactive, has a much greater demand upon the network. So if you think about aging at home, what would that look like? If you have somebody has dialysis at home instead of driving into a dialysis center, this could change the way people live. Security, you're not going to want to have that in a hackable scenario, which could be the internet. And even things like gaming, where the thing that you're trying to achieve there is the lowest latency possible. And I'm not a gamer. My 16-year-old son, is, it's all he does. But it doesn't interest me. But I do see the value in that. Because one day, you start to think about what does it look like when people are sitting in an office and they're operating robots remotely in a safe environment, and that connection has a low latency connection, and that person, that's how they work. And again, these are not the future, these are things that already exist today, you just don't have the infrastructure support it. And then the fourth part of that program is consumers. And this looks a lot of different ways. Um, consumers are people, residents, businesses, uh, a wireless cellular antenna, uh, a camera on the street, a utility sensor, all these things use that network. If you think about the concept of connectivity, you know, today cell phones are connected, your laptop's connected, um, your clothes can now be connected, your pets can be connected, your vehicle will be connected. Everything is going to be connected. What's that connection going to look like? Who is that end user of that connection? So when we look at these four different aspects of a broadband program, and start to think about it a little bit differently. And the business model starts to look a little bit different. So you're going to hear the phrase feasibility study, and this gets into semantics a little bit. But feasibility, in this case, it's always feasible. You just have to find a business model that works. Because at the end of the day, is this something that you really want to do without? And you know, Doug's used the concept of you know, the electrification of the United States back in the 1900s. Well, if you got left out, you seriously got left out. That's where we are today with broadband connectivity. So some things that we're seeing today as we're talking to different communities, and a lot of times I go into a, a case just like this, and I'm being told, hey, we know broadband is important, we know there's money allocated for it, but we don't really understand what that means. So that's why we're going to come out today and just have a conversation with you, and to start to see if you've been thinking about this. It's something every community needs to address. And every community is going to address it and define their response to it in a very different way because every community is different. But here's a few things that we've typically seen. So a community probably doesn't have a broadband master plan. And so you've got a sewer and storm drain master plan, probably have a streets master plan, a sidewalk master plan, but have you specifically and intentionally created a broadband master plan? Do you know how you want your community to be connected? Do you know what's in your community to support that level of connectivity? Now, there are other incumbent telecommunications companies, and what they've done is great. But is what they've built, is it sustainable? Is it expandable? Is it going to support the kind of connectivity you want? Because from a twisted copper or a coaxial position, I don't see it lasting for just a few more years. I will tell you, from my perspective, I'm a fiber guy. I love fiber connectivity. But you're never going to have fiber without wireless. Everything is going to be wireless connected at some point. But for that level of connectivity in a wireless scenario, you're going to need a lot more fiber to support all those connections. So they're always tied together. So what does your community look like? Have you developed a broadband master plan? The second one, looking at a lack of integration of these technologies, go back to that list I was talking about earlier. 
into your existing or proposed city services. So one of the things that always comes to mind, the gentleman who spoke before me talked about, hey, we're going to roll this out over time. These are the paths that we're using for routing. Well, you're going to open the ground. That's a great time to put some duct in the ground for fiber. And the city may use it for what it's doing. You may use some kind of AMI system to operate with that network, that water network for switching and monitoring. It could be something that you can lease to a telecommunications company lower their costs so they can come in and build more network that serves you better. Gap number three is a need to deploy broadband technologies to increase the quality of life. It's really easy, to, I grew up in this era where the phone company's going to take care of that aspect. And most of the subdivisions we've seen designed, they design for storm drain, they design for power, they design for sewer, but they don't design for telecommunications. That's not really ingrained in the way we do things. It's always an afterthought. So instead of just relying on somebody else to come and fix that problem, as a community, have you started to address and think about what are you going to push in your communities? Is it Wi-Fi downtown? Is it closed circuit cameras for security? Is it an ITS intelligent traffic system? All those things, again, use broadband connectivity. And then the lack of public-private partnerships to deploy new technologies. So this is something kind of new in our space. Again, go back to that slide that had the three highlights where the telco takes care of everything. This looks very different. It wasn't just until just a couple of years ago that we started to see trillions of dollars being allocated for broadband. And it's not going to the big telcos. Historically, it always has. The government's been funding telecommunications companies for decades. That's not happening the same way anymore. Those dollars are coming to the states, and the states are disseminating those funds down to the communities. Now those funds are great, but they're not going to be enough to do everything we need done. But it is enough to come in and partner with private equity and have those folks come in and together we can start to accomplish these goals. So that, that P3 I think is going to be a significant way that things get done in the future. So some of the things we talked about, and Doug mentioned um, the ARPA, and the state has disseminated half of those funds. There's another $240 million, I think, left to disseminate. Those are allocated by the state. Um, IIJA, when that comes out, that should be coming out in the April-May time frame. We're still developing what that's going to look like. But NTIA is going to hand that responsibility down to the state. The state's going to decide who gets those funds. And one of the key things they're looking for, and I'll show you a slide just a second, is a pre-deployment plan. My world, that's a broadband master plan. You can't just go ask for dollars for broadband. You've got to have a strategy. So this is kind of the sequence of events, how we see this unfolding. We're working with the uh, Georgia Technology Authority, GTA. Uh, they're going to be carrying the, the banner for the state with broadband and the way those funds are going to be disseminated, we believe. That first aspect is the broadband master plan. Um, that is step one. Now, if you look at ARPA funding, you can use those funds for master planning. You cannot use those funds for assessments and studies, and that's an important distinction. According to the literature, you can use it for planning activities that could possibly go towards a broadband deployment program. So this would qualify for that. <coughs> once you've done that, a broadband master plan can look a lot of different ways. Are you going to build out fiber to every home in the community? Are you going to build a fiber ring to support cell towers? Are you going to develop a microwave network to, to provide connectivity to cell towers that you can then go point to multipoint to people in that community? It can come out a lot of different ways. Again, every community is different. But once you've understood what that infrastructure need is through the broadband master plan, you can start working with business models. What other private equity may want to come in? What other funds we may go pursue? So that's the third case is pursuing the funding. And if you look at that top bullet, um, a few key parts. Federal government's already allocated $45 billion for this. You'll hear the BEAD, B -A -D fund. It's a subset of IIJA. Well, they're going to give every state $100 million just to start with. And then, based on applications, they'll disseminate the rest of those funds. That third bullet talks about an actionable pre-deployment plan. That's the broadband after plan. That's what they're looking for. 
Now the specifics for what that's going to include don't exist today. They're still developing that. But we're trying to work with the state and go, hey, here's some things that you might want to be looking for. And the broadband master plan that we're doing for different communities today is helping us develop what that's going to look like. Whether it's mapping your community for a good GIS database, if it's meeting a certain level of service, or if you're going to hear speeds and megabits, you're here download and upload speeds. What are those parameters? They keep changing. But one of the key aspects is we know we don't want to build something that's only good for two or three years. This needs to be a long-term infrastructure investment. And we do believe that when they evaluate these applications, that's what they're going to be looking for. So once you do have the funding, and that's going to be a combination of some federal funds, maybe some local funds, certainly some private equity funds to put the whole project together, you can go in and you can deploy that network. And when you do, this is not going to happen overnight. This is a multi-year, multi-decade process. You're going to be working with permitting. You're going to be working with the city and the county. You're working with the poll owners, which is in most cases the power company. If you're going to put anything in the air or in the ground. You're working with streets, and sanitation, and other utilities. There's a lot of moving parts. And there's getting equipment, materials, construction, building these things out. All the while, you're at some level disrupting that community. But once you've got this built, and that network has been put in place, what else can you do with it? So the last aspect is technology master plan. Now, you hear the phrase, you know, build it and they will come. And that's a really hard sell to get bank financing. But this is going to be one of those cases when you start to look how everything is going to be connected. This is a build it and they will come aspect. May not build a model and a business model. But you need to be taking steps today that five years, 10 years, 25 years down the path makes sense. So that's a bit of a picture of the way we're seeing the different broadband models come to fruition today. Um, again, look at those four aspects. There's the network owner, the network operator, the different service providers, and then the way consumers use that network. Thank you all, and of course we're happy to answer any questions. I think everyone's provided a, uh, a hard copy of that PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I know that's a lot of information, we just thrown at you uh, and everything, I understand. But uh, we're happy to answer any questions or comments. And, and as Lee said, we're obviously very engaged. I talk directly to the Georgia Technology Authority. I talk directly with Josh Ellibrand, who's the director of the Broadband Initiatives understanding what the state's going to be doing and what they're going to be expecting of communities uh, in sense of if they're going to apply for these grants once they know how much money they're going to get. And uh, so we're, as, a, as an organization, we're in constant communication with the state to understand and help our clients and, uh, that we work with and help to understand what they need to be doing and get prepared. And understand this money, you know, some folks are thinking, oh my goodness, all the money's going to come out next fall. This is not something that's going to happen immediately in the sense of overnight. What we're going to know is exactly what is the formula that the states are going to be able to receive money on. Uh, and that's still yet to come. That will probably be here in April or May. The feds are probably going to roll that out to the states. And then at that point, the states themselves have to have a state plan on broadband, just so y'all know. And how this works is not unusual. You see this in transportation planning. So you want to come and apply for money, you must have a plan yourself, just as Lee was talking about. And then that gets rolled into either a regional transportation plan or a state transportation plan, where you're going to see the same thing on broadband. It's going to be rolled into a state broadband plan. The state will have its issues it wants to address, but if you're going to apply, that's why you need to have your plan ready, because that's going to be incorporated into the state plan in a sense from a funding standpoint from the federal government. There's going to be guidelines that the feds are going to be looking at specifically on any plan, any money under the IIJA, and it's specifically geared toward governments. As Lee said earlier, they're not giving money directly to the telecos like they have in the past. They want local governments, states and local governments, to be involved in this process now, to have decision making as it relates to public policy. Because in the past, with all due respect, it was here you go, AT&T, and the local governments and the state really were involved in where that money went. One of the point on that, the local, and again, we're, we work with the telecos, just so you know, so we're not, we don't have anything against the telecos, we, but you have to understand, they're working on an ROI of only three to five years. Seriously, 
five years is your long term investment, return on investment from telecoms. So AT&T or Comcast or Spectrum, whoever it is, they're not looking beyond five years on their investment. Well, obviously your community, you deal with these issues, you know five years is nothing in the sense of the time frame. So that's why the federal government and the new IHA is insisting that this go through government in the sense, because government can take a longer term view of these issues and think accordingly and plan accordingly. So they're going to be asking uh, those local governments and whoever else as part of their plan to be looking at other issues like uh, underserved and unserved areas as part of the plan. And also, uh, are you going to have affordable services for your citizens? Doesn't mean, you know, you can't have other types of levels of services, but you have a basic form. Like in the old days, well, I don't want to say the old days, but, you know, AT&T or Bell South or whoever, would have a basic phone plan that everybody could afford. You're gonna, the governor is going to be requesting that you, as a local government or whoever is applying for this money, come up with a plan. Of how are you going to do that? And that's where you need to work with your partners and whoever, whoever else is going to be involved. So, those are some more additional items uh, to be aware of as uh, as this opportunity comes forth. So it's going to be 45 billion dollars directly going to the states that was mentioned. And then after that, the states will be the ones to determine who the sub grantees would be. So, for example, Perry would be a sub grantee who would apply. So, I'm going to stop there, happy to answer any questions. And of course, if y'all come up with something later, it's like, you know, in the middle of the night, you wake up and go, I meant to ask that question. <laughs> don't call me at three in the morning. But uh, please don't hesitate to reach back out to us. Obviously, we've been working with Ashley here, who's been a great. I can tell you that as someone who deals with lots of economic development folks who has a real understanding of this infrastructure. And so, you know, if you have any questions or answer, we'll, we'll be happy to come back and talk or just give us a call. We'll be happy to explain that. Questions, council members? My uh, question would be do we have a broadband master plan? Do we have one here? Oh, no, I don't think. I don't think many communities. I, I couldn't. I couldn't name a community in Georgia right now that has a broadband master plan at all. I mean, most of our services have been provided with the telecos coming in with fiber and stuff like that. We've been dependent totally on you know the private sector to provide that. So, it has not been something of focus that we've had. So, as this is changing, it's, it's a, a requirement change for the city. So we just kind of have to look. At You're a good company, by the way. To devise a master plan, I guess you would have a committee. Who would, uh, who do you foresee, who would you foresee that would make up that committee, or what, what type of people would be on that committee? Uh, would it be a conflict of interest to have, say, two people from the city of Perry on this committee devised the, the, the grand plan, but would you invite AT&T people or Verizon people to be part of that plan? Well, Who has the expertise to even devise this plan? Well, I, I guess to kind of back up before, I'm going to let Lee address that too. As someone who deals in public policy as much as I have, at that point, the question is, well, we, how we operate at Foresight is we kind of come in, and it was mentioned earlier, previous uh, presentation. As a community, you need to have an owner's rep, is the terminology you've heard the term. What it means is have someone who works for y'all who understands these complex issues and everything. And then, to the point of what you're suggesting, uh, which is not unusual all, is that, okay, once you've got that expert by your side who is there to work on your behalf, not anyone else's behalf, to help you figure out what do you need to do next and how to, and again, each community is different. Some communities do it different. They do a committee. They, they sometimes don't do a committee. Again, it's up to the community how they want to proceed. I'll let Lee, you might want to talk about that because you've had some experience with that too. And what we reference, you can come up with any kind of different name, but a broadband advisory committee is one that we've heard before. Um, it definitely needs to have members from city council, um, people who can push agendas, make decisions, things of that nature. I think it does need to have somebody who's a third-party uh, subject matter expert 
somebody to like us, but you know, definitely it doesn't mean that the AT&T's, Verizon's, CenturyLink's, Windstream's, whoever else, if they're in the community, let them be part of this. Again, I want to reiterate, they're not the enemy. Um, this isn't an us versus them kind of a scenario. Uh, it's just a different approach. And it is evolving, and you have to go with that and understand that's how things are going to move forward. So I think having them be part of that. But within the community, I think community members need to be part of this. So in my mind, I go to who are the people who see the lack of connectivity? So healthcare providers, maybe elementary school principals because they're dealing with kids who need to do homework. You have local employers that have this kind of thing. Certainly business owners who could benefit from this kind of level of connectivity. Anybody from uh, EMA, fire departments, police stations. I think you should create a group of those kinds of folks. Going back to that list, I should probably pull back up. All the different services you could have. Who's your go-to point that community? Let that community voice drive what that looks like and contribute to that factor. The thing that we would do as a subject matter expert is we can tell you, you know, what's this going to cost? What should the network look like? How long is it going to take to build it? What hurdles are you going to have to jump over in order to accomplish these goals? But really, we don't want to come in here and tell you what you need. We want to show you what it's going to cost to get the things that you define that you need. One of my favorite questions that I ask employers, uh, my clients, my children, what do you want to do? And that's something that as a community, you're going to define that for yourself. And then everybody else can come and help you understand how to achieve that goal. So I think definitely a broadband act advisory committee um, to develop and begin to develop that master plan. In our area, we have four different entities. We have citizens of Houston County, we have citizens of Warren Robins, of Centerville, of Perry. Would it be, it seems like to me it could be at cross purposes if everyone didn't have the same master plan for broadband. So, speaking from that direction, so a lot of times you're going to see just a small city come in and do something. We're working with cities, private developers that are near 250 homes being built, uh, counties, multi county regional committees. I'm working with some state level right now. Um, in my perspective, and I'm always going to look at it mathematically. What's the smartest way to approach this in order to achieve the goal? Because at the end of the day, it's always going to be about money. So when you're working at a regional level, that's the most efficient way to accomplish something. So even within a, say, a county of different cities, every city has some slightly different needs. So how can you come together and have the greatest benefit to that entire county, even though they may have some slightly different needs? And what's applicable to that community? So right now, the reason that you're seeing so much infrastructure investment coming into play is because it does not make financial sense to go to the country. In rural areas, the business model will never work. You've got to have that level of investment to get the ball rolling. Now, once you look ahead and you start to go, okay, well, we can use federal funding to lower the cost of building that network, but then what other funds may come in to subsidize monthly fees? That could be part of it. Or when people really do cut the cord and they're no longer using television service, they're getting everything off of a stream or off of a private service. Those are going to change those business models. So what you're referencing was how different communities that can be competing within a region, how do you to play better together, find out what their specific needs are, and how those dovetail together in a big regional model. Well, when you mentioned the rural areas, I mean, we have, you know, just places just we have Perry, kind of like this, and Houston County all in between. And in some of those little fingers of Houston County, broadband service is terrible. And, but yet it's very close geographically to the city of Perry's, which is why I'm, I was thinking, and some of those are huge businesses. They're in the country, but they're huge businesses. And if, if the county had a different plan from the city, I just wondered how effective that way. And let me kind of go back, I'll be getting weedy for just a little bit because I think we'll draw a better picture. So if you do look at a county, the first thing a fiber network designer is going to think about is I'm going to have to create a fiber ring. It may be multiple rings. So those pockets of density where the business model does work, how do I connect all those different pockets together? Okay, well by doing that, I now have created infrastructure in that rural area. I've now built something I can build off of. And that can mean, hey, we go in, we put in a tower, we serve point to multi-point, and we provide service to them. 
Now, it may not be as fast as a gig, but you're still gonna get 100 megabits down, 10 megabits up, which is a lot better than the nothing that you have now. And it starts to build off of that. So to me, that's why looking at regional format, it starts to fill those gaps a lot faster than trying to do everything completely individual. And just real quickly on that too, I mean, this is not rocket science, and what I'm talking about is we have done tons of different types of infrastructure, be it water systems, sewer systems, um, you know, natural gas systems. There are models that we've done over the last hundred years of how do you do these things. So like in some communities, to your point, maybe the county, a city and the county works together, but you provide water and sewer service into the county, even though it's not in your jurisdiction. It's working out those, you're right, working out those arrangements in the sense of who's going to provide the infrastructure and how it's going to work. You go back to electrification, the comment I was made earlier. I refer to this as the electrical grid of the 21st century. In the early part of the 20th century, where I live up in Smyrna, Georgia, to give you a perfect example, so we're very close into Atlanta. So Georgia Power in the early 1900s got power, you know, ran electrical grid to Smyrna, but they would not go to Marietta, the county seat. Now think about that a second. County seat was not going to be off of electricity. So that's why you have all these MEACs. Marietta Power was created because they understood in the early 1900s that they didn't have an electrical grid. You can say goodbye to economic development. And so uh, that model of the MEACs, but then of course we had the rural areas. And of course that took until the 1930s until the federal government agreed to do the rural education administration. I remember having had a great aunt who was 12 years old. Dalton, Georgia, lived in Whitfield County. She remembers the day they got electricity in the farm, and that was in 1936. The point is, you, you're seeing a 30 year thing. It, I won't say it won't be exactly the same, but these models, the infrastructure may be different, but the concepts are very similar. So there's ways of doing this uh, you know, creatively, and it's been done in the past. So it's not like, oh my God, what do we do here? There's models that can be used and everything. One point I do want to make, and this is something that kind of surprises me. So everybody talks about autonomous vehicles, right? And uh, we've been working with communities, particularly Metro Atlanta, on autonomous shuttles. So you, know, you hear about this stuff. And there's a particular shuttle called Ollie. Not, not pushing the brand, but that's just one that comes and likes to do demonstrations. And uh, up in Atlanta, a lot of communities are looking at this type of technology, right? To run from their downtown to a, a heavy rail mortar station or something like that. Or a campus, like a college campus, have an autonomous shuttle system. Um, but here's something you need to understand. This is talking about the technology. The technology is here. The infrastructure is not in place to handle it. So that Ollie shuttle, every 10 minutes, it has to ping a portal and exchange one terabyte of information. It's 1,000 gigabytes instantaneously. Because the shuttle can't stay autonomous forever. Okay, It has to communicate. So the question we asked, so, we're dealing with communities right now. We had Tropolis CID, to give you an example, outside of the airport in Atlanta. They want to do a ton of shuttle, but when they realize they don't have the telecommunication infrastructure, and they, they, have to, they already know they don't, so they're asking us, just to let you know, we're doing that with them, to figure out what do you actually have, and could you actually deploy this technology? And of course, the answer is, no, you really can't. So these are issues, understanding whatever you do, do in the future, the sense of your infrastructure, is understanding the technologies and Needs and, and really what it's about is called bandwidth. Can you handle all this telecommunication and all this data? And so, you know, that's the point too that you have to be looking at and understanding that right now you could not deploy that. So, an autonomous shuttle, one terabyte, autonomous vehicle, you know, the idea is going to be a, a living room with wheels, you know, so in your, in your car, maybe you need know, to watch TV or whatever. They're talking up to one petabyte. A petabyte is 1,000 terabytes. So, not trying to overwhelm anybody, but understanding the future is here. The technology is here. The question is, can you deploy the technology? That's really the question. So, I'll stop there. If you have any other questions, I know you got other things to talk about tonight. If our best choice of doing something about this, how do we go about it? Do we hire your company? How much you cost, etc. How long does it take to get up and running? I'm gonna let I'm gonna let I'm the director of business development. He's the private band guy, so I'm gonna let him talk about it. Because <laughs> I don't make I don't want to speak. So, so absolutely we, we would love to come in and do this with you guys. Um, we've done this quite often, so it's our area of expertise. Typically it's gonna take around six months to really develop a really sound plan. Now we've modeled that in different ways for different communities. 
based on how much research they've already done internally themselves. Um, you can go and you can look at some FCC data. It's not the best data, but it'll give you a starting point. Um, if you've already done any kind of demand aggregation or survey within the community, that's always helpful information. But to actually go in and pull streets, pull residential address data, business address data, start to model that to a geospatial database, model that, map it, start to design a route plan, much like you saw with the, the sewer system earlier. Once you've designed that, you can start to understand what your capital expenses to build that would be, and what your operational expenses to maintain that and operate that would be. And that process usually takes around six months. So one of the things we're telling folks now, how do you pay for it? Well, when I started doing this five years ago, municipal broadband was not a big topic. And the question was, well, we don't have any money, and we don't want to create new bonds, and we don't want to raise new taxes. Well, you don't have to. You can use your ARPA dollars for this. And this is where it starts to get even more interesting. So you could use ARPA dollars to do a project like this, it's going to take, I call it four to six months just for good measure. That's going to align with what's happening with IIJA. We're going to start to release that information in Q2. We'll start making some decisions in Q3, Q4, and descending those funds next year, I believe. So those things start to line up there. Well, whatever dollars that you've contributed to ARPA for your broadband master plan, if you do move forward with deployment, IIJA is going to require a 25% match. Well, this is atypical. You can actually use your federal ARPA fund as part of your 25% match for your IIJA federal fund. So you still haven't touched tax dollars yet. Or they're not your tax dollars, you put it that way. Yeah, local tax dollars. So that's that's one mechanism for doing that. And I do want to make a comment on that. So so no, no, so no way it runs off. So the Treasury Department this fall said you can use your, your ARPA money for broadband master plans. They didn't use that quite term, and that's what they were talking about. Uh, I've been talking directly with the state. They're getting, they're getting indications out of Washington that they're probably going to say, you can take your study. This is not unusual. You've seen this in other things where you've done the preliminary engineering on something. You're going after federal dollars. And a lot of times you can count what you spent in your local dollars toward the match. It may not be the whole match, but it could be part of the match that you do. That's what we're being told initially is we're waiting to get this officially from the U.S. Treasury Department, that the ARPA money that you spend on a pre-deployment plan, as it's called in the IIJA, that money can be used as a torture match. So you can actually use federal dollars to match federal dollars, which is definitely a little different than in the past. So that's that's what that's about and everything. So these are the things that we deal with, that we, you know, we're constantly in communication with, that we're able to bring to our clients and say, be aware of this, this is what you may want to do, here's your opportunity to leverage and take advantage of these uh, opportunities coming out of, out of Washington and out of the state. Further questions, Council? I think this is something we're going to have to study and understand and what options are available to us as we move forward. Well, but that sounds like a good project for you. <laughs> we will be continuing looking into it. Do you have any, any, any other questions that you have? Work on that tomorrow. Mr. <laughs> Stoner, thanks. Mr. Conner, I appreciate you guys coming and sharing this with us, and we'll be in touch with you. Thank you, Thank you very much. We, we appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. All. Item 3B2 is the outline of the city's Black History Banner program. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thank you, Mayor and Council. I was asked to attend this meeting tonight to present a summary of the Black History Month banner project. Um, as you all know, February is Black History Month, and starting last year, the city of Perry decided to honor this momentous occasion by um, starting a Black History Month banner project. The mission of this project is to celebrate prominent African American members of the Perry community who have made notable impacts to our community. So um, some of them have been first uh, prominent physicians in the city. So first doctor, first lawyer, um, also first uh, for the city of Perry employees as well. Um, so honoring our first 
African American downtown manager, our first African American special events, um, I'm sorry, uh, leisure services director. So notable titles like that. Um, one of the uh, procedures for this, it's an application process. This is a free application that is hosted on the City of Perry's website on a special page uh, specifically dedicated to the Black History Month banner project. Um, this can be found year-round at perry-ga.gov backslash backslash uh, BHM. Applications typically have opened in the spring after the current banners come down and then we do have a deadline of September 1st uh, which allows our team to review the applications um, and go through them and get them prepared because it does take some time to transform them into the banners that you see on the streets. Um, we have all of the banners hung before February 1st, so that deadline gives us time to not only design the banners, but also print them and have Public Works actually hang them. The application fees for this project, uh, there are none. The City of Perry's Black History Month banner project aims to be inclusive of all socioeconomic levels, so there are no fees to apply for consideration, and if you are selected, there are no fees for your banner to be printed and hung. Um, there is a Black History Month committee that meets. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis, if not more frequently, to not only plan and review the banner applications, but any affiliated projects. So things like getting that information on the website, getting that information on social media, and then additionally, we have also taken on the planning of the Juneteenth Freedom Day Festival, which was started last year, and will be continuing this year and growing into a two-day project. Um, if there are any further questions or if further details are requested for this project, I would be happy to be the point of contact for that, and my information can be found on our website under the Special Events tab. Just one question, Ms. Turbin. Who all, who all is on the committee of the Black History Month at this time? Yeah, so this year's committee is comprised of Ms. Lyman Grace. Um, Jasmine Thomas, our downtown manager, Ms. Alicia Hartley, our special events coordinator, and myself. I have a question. Do we have any other banners that uh, feature individual people? Like throughout the year? I'm not familiar with that. Um, typically, my department doesn't oversee the banners that go up throughout the city. Um, this was a specific project that we assisted with, so the other banners that go up throughout the year Aside from the, I've only been here three years, so from the ones that I've seen, um, I know that we do feature, you know, photos that have been taken at events that have, you know, real people that live and play in Perry. Um, but I think as far as specific individuals, to my knowledge, no, um, but I could be wrong. I was just thinking that, you know, if we instituted a program for something like uh, Hispanics or mm -hmm. any, any other group of people, women, Sure. I don't know anybody um, that we would need to have that same fee schedule for, for sure. everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, I know lots of other cities. One of the whenever we first started reaching the researching this, like I said, I'm not really familiar with banners. This was my first time working on a project like this. Um, did research what some other cities have done for similar things, and a lot of the um, information that I used to put together, you know, our first round of banners last year was actually pulled from veterans' banners, mm -hmm. where cities would honor notable veterans in their community. Um, around one of those, you know, military patriotic center holidays. Other questions? These banners stay up a month. I don't know what's the time for them. Yes, sir. They stay up um, from February 1st to the end of the month, so the 28th or 29th, depending on the year. And then we actually do reuse the banners at the Juneteenth Festival, so they don't actually hang up outside of, on the street poles, but we hang them in the interior of the building, so they're actually showcased twice throughout the year. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Turpin. Thank Appreciate you. the information. Item 3B3 is the Downtown Development Authority's Development Finance. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, I was going to snag this uh, microphone and stand next to the screen, if that's okay. My eyes are failing me, and I also like to stand next to it and flail around my arms and that type of thing to make sure you're paying attention. Okay. You can hear me, I'm assuming. Uh, I wanted to get with you all this evening to have a discussion pertaining to 
uh, downtown development financing and the downtown development authority here in Perry utilizing financing as an incentive to attract and promote development in the downtown district. You will all remember, I believe it was November, early December, uh, there was a discussion right here pertaining to a project that the downtown development authority presented to you all. You know, in hindsight, we should have provided this type of information prior to that uh, and you know, we'll be sure to get information to you all sooner and um, it would take you, hopefully starting tonight, though, a bit of an education process on what exactly it was that was being proposed to you all that evening. Um, also, too, in a, in a recent uh, Downtown Development Authority meeting, uh, the chairman of the Downtown Development Authority brought up a question pertaining to what is it that mayor and council are expecting of them when it comes to downtown development financing. And there's a bit of uncertainty uh, with our Downtown Development Authority board members right now pertaining to uh, their ability to finance projects should they see uh, that project being beneficial for the downtown, if that makes sense. Left my clicker. Beautiful. I uh, wanted to take you through just a quick uh, synopsis pertaining to Downtown Development Authorities and what they are able to do pertaining to financing. Show you some project examples of how downtown development authorities and cities have incentivized development in their downtowns utilizing financing, and then bring up some possible uh, frameworks through which you all may be able to work and allow the downtown development authority to provide financing under certain circumstances um, that you all would approve. I'm sorry. <coughs> Uh, the official code of Georgia, Title 36, Chapter 42, commonly referred to as the Downtown Development Authorities Law. And this sets out what downtown development authorities are and what they can do. And the four bases for downtown development authorities being formed in the state of Georgia, you can see here. Uh, I'm not going to read these, you can do it all read. Uh, but generally, promote downtown development, promote a vital uh, downtown, a, a energetic area with all sorts of trade, all that type of thing. And two of the uh, items that are brought out in this is the ability to finance projects and the ability to issue bonds. So when the state said about providing local governments with this tool, because that's really what a downtown development authority is, is a tool for you all to promote development in ways that you are not able to. When they said about creating this tool for you all, they saw it as something that could provide for this financing mechanism through which you all may be able to work, and your downtown development authority board members may be able to work, um, that could really bring something to downtown that wasn't previously offered, if that makes sense. Go ahead. In the Title 36 code, there's 24 powers that are set out that the downtown development authority has. A lot of those are specific to financing and the ability of downtown development authorities to finance projects. In particular, these three stick out uh, to finance, to borrow money, and issue revenue bonds. Uh, that's basically the swap of what they're able to do. And essentially, it's, it's pretty much anything. They can go work with the bank. They can issue their own revenue bonds. Um, you know, there's a whole world available to them that you all can't do in working directly with developers to locate a project in the downtown development district. Go ahead. Simplified, but I think you get the point. And this is specifically pertaining to our downtown development authority because I think we need to we need to draw a distinction between downtown development authorities, ones that are credit worthy and ones that are not credit worthy. Uh, credit worthy downtown development authority has assets; they have a guaranteed revenue stream through which they are able to go out and pursue their own financing for projects. They are a separate legal entity; they can do that. Our downtown development authority is not credit worthy, so if they want to go out and finance projects, they actually have to have your all support. Uh, if you remember back in early de uh, December when you pre presented with that project, you're all support in order to go out as a credit worthy entity or backed by a credit worthy entity uh, and provide financing to a project, if that, if that makes sense. They do not have a guaranteed revenue stream, they do not have assets. So the Downtown Development Authority working to locate a project would ask you all for support, assuming you all saw it as a viable, good project for the city would enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the Downtown Development Authority. The Downtown Development Authority, there are three ways, there's promissory notes, but we don't really talk a lot about those because they're kind of out there, but 
or with traditional lenders or issue revenue bonds, the proceeds of those bonds can go to a project. The project, through a project agreement or a lease agreement, would pay back the downtown development authority, which would then pay back the, the lender or the, uh, the bondholders, if that makes sense. So again, very simple. Uh, it's just acting as a mechanism to work directly with a developer, and that's something that you all as a city cannot do. Go ahead. Some examples. And I'm trying to capture some big ones, some small ones, some rural ones, some metro ones, uh, but give you all an idea about how downtown development authorities have used financing to incentivize projects in their downtowns. This is Richland Run Distillery, Brunswick, Georgia. Just a beautiful early 1980s building here. It was vacant for a while. The Downtown Development Authority is working with a project, Richland Run, to locate in their downtown. They saw an opportunity. Uh, and you can see here the after kind of has like a Cuban theme going on, pretty nice. They were actually able to go to a bank, borrow $850,000 to acquire that building, do some renovations, that type of thing, and locate Richland Run in that facility. Richland Run has a lease agreement with the Downtown Development Authority, pays the Downtown Development Authority, who then pays back the bank that um, provided them with the funds to do that. And of course, it's, it's backed by the city. This is a big one, Parsons Alley. This is a, um, I forget acreage-wise, but it's a destination, restaurant, and retail district in Duluth, Georgia. Quite the site if you ever have, uh, have the opportunity to go see it. This used to be like old warehouses, surface parking lots, things that weren't really bringing a whole lot of value to their city. So over time, the city and the Downtown Development Authority went in and acquired this land, acquired some buildings, and worked with a developer to bring approximately 30,000 square feet worth of retail and restaurant space to their downtown. Go ahead. This is about a $10 million project. They worked with a developer who brought $1 million to the table. The city threw in $3 million out of the general fund, and this is for the uh, public improvements in this district, right? That's the sidewalk, that's the landscaping, the streetscaping. Um, they have little parklets, signage, that type of thing. City owns and maintains those. And then the Downtown Development Authority with the back in the city uh, got $6 million, issued $7 million, $6 million on revenue bonds that went to combined with the owner equity to the project for the um, renovation of existing buildings and the construction of new buildings in the district. The developer uh, located in those buildings, filled those buildings with tenants, and pays back the Downtown Development Authority with those proceeds so they can cover the, the revenue bond issuance debt service. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. This is another big one in the metro area. You know, the, the whole Peachtree Industrial Corridor, just you know, the city, all sorts of stuff going on. Very interesting, very progressive DDAs up there. Sugar Hill, I believe, used to be a relatively small town. It's big now, obviously. Uh, but they saw the need for a downtown district. They wanted basically to create a downtown where they did not have one. So they went out and created what they called the epicenter in their downtown area. It's about 200,000 square feet of mixed use. Uh, it's commercial, it's public use facilities. Uh, I believe there's some, some residential in there, restaurants, retail, that type of thing. This one here in particular is about a $50 million project. The city contributed $7 million in SPLOS funds. Let's switch over here real quick. The SPLOS funds, again, like the Sugar Hill project, went to, for the, the public areas, if that makes sense. They have a beautiful amphitheater back here, streetscaping, landscaping, all that type of thing. And then the Downtown Development Authority back in the city issued $41.8 million in revenue bonds. That went for the construction of the project. And they have, it's all leased out, and the proceeds from those leases uh, go to pay back the revenue bonds. A smaller one, but a, a really nice one, and uh, you'll see here in a second, it used a lot of different financing mechanisms. I wanted to show you this one in particular. Clarksville, Georgia, 2014-2015, uh, I believe it was, there was a fire downtown. It gutted a lot of their old historic buildings right in their town square, very sad. Uh, however, the uh, city and the downtown development authority saw an opportunity and they actually went in and, and redeveloped these two buildings. There's a building over here you can't see. There was a building here. It was too far gone from the fire. Uh, so they came in with like a nice, you know, infill park <coughs> alleyway improvement type of project. I wanted to show you all this one because it essentially utilized the entire swath of financing mechanisms that are available to downtown development authorities. Just to remind you all this stuff is out there. 
So you can see that the Downtown Development Authority went out and pursued a bank loan backed by the city. They used state and federal historic preservation tax credits, which are super lucrative. And um, you know, I believe it's going to be coming to you all, but the Historic Preservation Commission um, could facilitate some of that stuff for us, possibly. They actually received a redevelopment grant from the state, Georgia City's Foundation Loan, Downtown Development Authority Revolving Loan Fund. The city threw in again on the public improvement stuff, the big alleyway project back there, and then the streetscaping and some other things and then a loan from the city to the DDA um, to help with some of the renovation and build out stuff. So it was about a $3 million project and all, and they really brought the kitchen sink or whatever to make it happen. Um, really, just a really nice project. A small restaurant project, the city of Cordelia had a restaurant tour, but I think it was operating a catering type deal. They wanted to open a storefront, and they actually came in and helped finance this project. It's not the right photo. Uh, but $300,000 bank loan the DDA went out and got at 2.5%, issued it to the restaurant at 4.5%, so basically charging kind of the finance fee, making a little money there, uh, which is great. You know, as a downtown development authority here in the city of Perry, I would like to get to a point where we are generating revenues um, to become more of a credit worthy type of organization. Uh, but, you know, they wanted a restaurant, they went out and got a restaurant. This is a big redevelopment project in the city of Noonan. The University of West Georgia was looking for a location in Newton. They had an old hospital that I believe was not really being utilized or wasn't being utilized to its potential, and they saw a redevelopment opportunity. Uh, it's a $16.5 million project. You can see the, the players here, I believe they're doing like some um, nursing medical type stuff there, so the hospital was a player on that. And then the city brought in uh, $1.5 million in SPLOST for the project, and the Downtown Development Authority went out to a local lender uh, for the rest of it, help the build out, and then their, their tenants, the University of West Georgia is actually paying back um, the, the bank loan on that. So a different way of going about it, a really nice, I guess, public-private partnership. Just some examples of some projects. There's a number of them out there. Um, but moving forward, it really is a, a viable tool for the city and the downtown development authority to have in their toolbox, and I hate, you know, I'm sorry about all the cliches tonight, but that's just kind of the DCA in me. Um, it is a, a good tool, and if it's okay with you all, if you're generally favorable towards the utilization of financing at some level, whatever that might be for projects downtown, I would actually ask you all to allow us to go back to the Downtown Development Authority Board and put together some sort of policy, right? that provides a little bit of guidance, you know, provides a, um, something that the Downtown Development Authority can work with moving forward with projects, but also provides you all with some assurances about how that project is going to take place. And essentially allows you all to approve a, a process and a, a framework through which financing can be offered to Downtown Development Authority projects. I, I looked, I'll go back please if you don't mind. I looked at a number of different ones that, that current uh, municipalities are using across Georgia. Some kind of recommendations, some stuff that's out there. You know, I don't know, this, this stuff over here is not, not super big. I want to focus on financing, but a redevelopment, infill development focus. Uh, having some sort of threshold where the private partner that you're working <coughs> with has to have a requisite level of skin in the game, if you will. I'm not sure what that might be. Um, Perhaps you know they have to bring at least two hundred fifty thousand dollars or twenty percent of the total cost to the table, something like that. That's kind of a common uh, threshold that I've seen out there. Job creation, you know, so just core economic development stuff that you're looking at is private investment, job creation, and if they meet the threshold that you all establish, then you all say, yeah, you know, we can do some financing to a certain extent, if that makes sense, <coughs> and we can structure this all sorts of different ways, but making sure that they're providing the Downtown Development Authority and you all with sufficient documentation to show that they are a viable project and that they will bring benefits to downtown, they will bring benefits to the community. Go ahead, Jerry. And based on our discussion back in December, I wanted to make sure that we hit on some things that I think you all may want to see in this should we choose to move forward. <clears throat> some, some safeguards, right? If you're all going to back the Downtown Development Authority in these financing projects, 
we could totally put in place these types of, of safeguards. So you have percentage or total project investment camp. So again, what sort of percentage of the project would you all require of the, of the project? Is there a certain, you know, we, we're not going to do more than a million dollars ever for any project. Is it, is it we're not going to do more than 40% of a project, is it, if that makes sense. So some sort of threshold that sets where you all are comfortable with. Feasibility study, fiscal and economic impact studies. Uh, a lot of this stuff's pretty common with industrial development, but we could tailor it you know, for um, smaller projects in the downtown district. Uh, you know, we could get Ms. Newby uh, on this with the sound MOU and project agreements uh, and make sure that we have in place uh, projects that are the types of projects that you all, the Downtown Development Authority, want to see in our Downtown Development District. The big thing, clawbacks and performance agreements, you know, there are certain performance measures that this project is going to have to meet in certain time frames or they have to start paying the money back. You know, so it's not just providing money or financing for projects without any sort of agreement in place. You know, there's all sorts of uh, measures and things that they would have to meet. It's, it's very similar actually to the Commodore building project where they had certain time limits in regards to when they had to start construction. It had to be a certain type of project, that type of thing. So we could really fine tune that uh, for something that, that would provide you all the level of insurance that I think you're looking for in this. And then something too, a state participation requirement. If it would make you all, as a, as a city, more comfortable, um, I, you know, certainly go out and explore what options are available to the state. You know, you saw the little um, downtown Clarksville project. They went all out and got all sorts of state um, programs to come in and help them with their project. But if the project is able to go out and have the state say that, yes, this is a viable project, we're going to give you $250,000 in downtown development revolving loan funds, but that hopefully would provide you all some assurances that okay, you know, the state's in on this, we got the state, we got the project, let's do a little something for the project as well. So you could say that you know state has to participate in whatever sort of project you're looking at financing, if that makes sense. Go ahead, Joey. That's what I got for you all this evening. Um, I, I hope this was somewhat beneficial. I uh, you know be happy to try and answer any questions you may have, but generally. I'd like for you all to uh, have a discussion and generally determine if it's something you want us to continue to move forward with. You know, if you want us to go and maybe look at some policy type stuff to bring all back to you all, um, the Downtown Development Authority Board really needs your guidance and uh, I'm hoping to get that from you all. All right, a couple of questions. First question is, um, I know it's obviously an issue with economic development to go out and recruit businesses, restaurants, et cetera, and so forth. Would economic development be involved with the DDA in this process, like going forward? Our city's economic development function? Yes. It certainly could be. Yeah, I, I would like for it to be, I guess that's my two cents. And, and then also going forward with, I guess, three cents instead of just two. My general feeling is on this. Um, you know, when the project was presented to us last time, basically 100% financing, uh, I was very hesitant about that. Um, you know, you said the phrase tonight, I believe Ms. Fine and Grace said it uh, when it was presented to us. Uh, and I always love when I can quote Ms. Fine and Grace. Um, but I know, yes. <laughs> um, but for a prospect to have more or majority uh, or most, whatever added to use skin in the game, I think is important. Um, that being said, uh, I am not philosophically opposed to the DDA going out and you know looking for a prospect. And if that prospect uh, is something that we as council and, and the DDA and the city feel will be of great benefit to our downtown, uh, then I'm not opposed philosophically to some structure of public financing has been discussed being included uh, in in that overall structure. Those are my feelings. Uh, I certainly welcome other council members uh, input and discussion on it as well. And I would think we would do that on a case by case basis uh, as opposed to any sort of blanket, you know, statement one way or another. I feel that uh, that's a good presentation that you gave to us. 
one of the things that you're saying is that I think you need to have a guideline, a policy, that you were making a statement, something to to guide them by. Because most times, if there's a crisis going on, nine times out of ten, what I just seen is that we'll probably be back in it. You know what I mean? So we need to have something in place to uh, support, uh, encourage, uh, motivate, but yet still we're going to have a, a guideline, you know, to do what we need to do, you know what I mean? So we're going to have a, a boundary, a cap, or whatever you want to say that we can work with downtown development to get the project moving forward, but yet still we got a, a guideline that we got to maintain or live within. I think my, my thoughts from what you said tonight uh, when you talked about BDAs being um, credit worthy and not credit worthy, I would think that I would like to see if there's a policy that their number one priority would be to become credit worthy. Uh, when they are able to um, operate within their own funds, even though their funds are also taxpayer funds, even except for maybe when they've been able to make a little money on an increased interest rate or something like that, um, that they are the ones who, uh, I just feel like they, sometimes we might get ahead of our skis if we borrow money, but we don't really have the money to pay it back if it became necessary, we're going to have to go somewhere else to get it. So I would love to see them be credit worthy. Um, prior to what's probably popular opinion, I love the DDA. I think they do, can do great and exciting things for downtown. Um, but they definitely need a policy before uh, they come back with a project. And I'm not opposed to them selling any assets that they have or assets that the city passes on to them so that they do fill up their their own funds. Even though that's still taxpayer money, I feel differently about it once it gets into their hands because they're the ones that are going to be in charge of how it's dispersed and what it's dispersed for. And they're going to oversee whatever type of project um, might go there or else they don't uh, you know, make the loan to these people. Um, I, I think maybe a good place to start if they had their own funds was, would just be to complete that alleyway project that's been going on for a few years now. I don't know if, I don't know exactly who took that on, if it was Main Street or DDA, but it's a long uh, standing project and um, I, just, I, I just am curious about how other DDAs became credit worthy. I'd like to know that. Um, and then my favorite project and the ones that you uh, presented us was the one for the university campus that was uh, doing nursing and the hospital put in money and the university put in money. If, if University of Georgia or Middle Georgia College or whoever is around us now, Mercer, uh, wanted to put a satellite campus here that um, could benefit all of our community and all of our citizens. I can see our participation in that. Or a medical facility. Uh, I could see our participation in that with a hospital. Um, I don't see us in need of, in our downtown, I, I, I would have to associate it with need. And um, so that, that would be a bottom line for me. I'd have to associate it with the um, but I think there are a lot of wonderful things they can do, and, and I just want them to be funded. You know, that's just where it, where I come down on that. Uh, I am interested in, first of all, you guys are doing a great job with the small loans that you're already making. And I think at this point in time, it is time for us to start looking at a financial structure <coughs> that we can do some of these things. So I would like to see some kind of policy in place as to how that would work. Uh, 
other comments or thoughts? I would, I would just say that I, I would think that the DDA is currently frustrated right now because they, they are, I guess, you know, basically without structure as far as what projects they might can try to attract here. Uh, but I would applaud the efforts of us having what Robert just mentioned, uh, some sort of uh, policy because I think when you start freelancing unlimited with no guidance it, it can turn out bad and hurt feelings from other downtown businesses can can happen so the, I think the more structure we have the more you got to have 20 employees or 15 and you got to have 20 percent of the business I think the more of those we can create, it would, it would protect the DDA as well and give them some some guidance. So I, I would look forward to uh, that presentation. I agree with Dr. Albright, and I would just add one thing that I would, for me, I would not want the DDA to feel limited in terms of the type of project that they felt confident in, in pursuing. Um, you know, if we're going on a case-by-case -case basis, and you know, maybe it is the university deal, like Ms. Peterson mentioned, or maybe it's a restaurant, or maybe it's uh, if any type of project that the DDA feels is going to add that much more viability uh, and, and generate that much more traffic to our downtown, I think is worthy to uh, pursue and for us to consider. Other comments? To just summarize what I have heard is that you would like to have Mr. Smith put together in conjunction with the DEA a set of guidelines that would be acceptable to this body as far as limits and percentages of ownership and job creation and things like that that would be the outline for them to be looking for various businesses or educational opportunities or medical opportunities that would come to our downtown. Is that close to what I've heard? Okay. Mr. Smith, would you work with the DDA to come with some policy guidelines that they feel like that they could work with? Uh, that would give them some flexibility to go out and look at various opportunities. Yes, Okay, thank you. Appreciate your work on that. Some interesting things going on around the state. Uh, item 3B4 is consider proposal to amend our annual leave. Mr. Gilmore. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, there will be no PowerPoint presentation on this discussion. Uh, I have provided to you a suggestion from administration. As you may or may not be aware, we have been approached about uh, considering making some type of payout uh, or no cap payout or annual leave if an employee dies on the job. And as I state in my memo to you all, uh, that is very understandable. Has a very strong emotional tie, but singular type events in and of themselves are not necessarily the best way to establish a policy. So what the administration would like to do is bring up that demon again, uh, paid time off. Uh, however, there are some significant differences with that. If you are agreeable certainly not expecting any decision from you at all. If you are agreeable even just to continue the process, then uh, the administration's recommendation would we, be we notify all the employees, we have hearings, come back, you know, similar to what we did before, and then you can make your determination. Uh, one of the major differences with this proposal, there are several, but one of the first ones is, is that it does not do anything relative to employee sick leave. That remains exactly the same. Whatever balance they have when you enact it, that's the balance they maintain. They still use it. We don't mess with the sick leave at all. You may remember that was one of the concerns that was expressed to you 
last time we talked about this. Their program. sick leave balance. Yes. Because we'll do away with the sick leave program itself and it'll become personal time off. That is, that is correct. It, it's just, just the remaining balance. That they That's right. Whatever that balance is, whenever you, if you approve it, whenever you determine the effective date of that is. In lieu of not having any accrue and continue to accrue sick leave, there is an increase in how much they will increase in their PTO leave. You may remember we had talked about that before. Uh, the employee will be able to use the PTO for any particular purpose. So the employee could use it for sick if they wanted to, or time off, whatever the case may be, it would be their time. Uh, it will uh, accrue, you may remember, attached to is a couple of his exhibits showing the differences, uh, but we will make a distinction, which we do not have right now, between the, we currently have standard employee or standard time, which generally revolves around 40 hour employee, and then we have fire. This proposal, which we had before, would be add another calculation for accrual for police officers since they have to work 12 hour shifts. So in other words, they would accrue at a greater rate than you would have. Um, there is also a proposed increase relative to the uh, PTO payout amount, you know, when an employee separates from the city, regardless of what the reason is. Uh, what we think the benefits would be, and I'll grant you this at least as the administration's perspective on this right now, but the first one is it does recognize and give some accountability for longevity. Uh, in the schedule that we have there, there are a couple of other areas that have been added for a greater payout depending on longer years of service that you've had with the city. Uh, it incentivizes, uh, incentivizes, sorry, I can't get out. Anyway, the employees can be responsible and stewards for their own time. It raises the payout totals on separation, whatever the reason of separation is. Uh, like I mentioned before, it increases the accrual rate for 12-hour shift police officers. And it does, as I mentioned before, give the employees the opportunity to decide how they would like to spend their particular layout. Now, it is important, I want to point this out, that this proposal does not recommend a total payout of PTO time for everybody on whatever they have accrued across the board. The reason it is not for everybody the total amount is the city cannot afford to have that type of liability. We increase it, in other words, we phased an increase with it with this proposal, but we cannot afford to have a complete payout of your accrued uh, annual leave and PTO time, at least, at least at this time. And that's never been the city's policy, has it? That is correct. It, it never has been. Uh, there is a difference in perspective, which I totally understand. From the employee standpoint, it can be perceived or possibly understood that the city is providing X amount of annual leave and X amount of sick leave for me. And as I accrue it, if I don't use it, I should be able to have some type of access to it or complete access to it. Historically and currently, the city's position as the employer is that yes, you accrue these items, but they are basically like insurance. They're available for you to use under particular circumstances, and there is a cap on that. Uh, what we're proposing to you makes a slight modification with that, moves towards an opportunity for an employee to collect more at their separation time, but still protects the financial integrity of the city about maintaining a cap. So like I said, uh, you know, certainly review if you have any other questions. If there's no immediate objections uh, from the council, then our recommendation would be we proceed with the usual process about explaining and going through it with the employees, 
have a hearing for you all where they can have whatever comments they want and then you can make your determination of what it is you'd like to do, if it. Questions or comments? Comment, I, I like that, the last idea. Uh, you give an employment, like you said, you <coughs> give the input, like you were saying, while I go, what's going on, and then after we hear comments from everyone, then we can make the final decision that going forward. That's right. I mean, you all would have to make the final decision no matter what. Yeah. But, but, like we, do, but we do recommend the employee. Right. We'd like to hear from you. Thoughts, comments, questions? Mr. Gilmore, have your authority to move forward with the employee discussions? Yes. Please move forward, Mr. Gilmore. Have Thank you. I don't know. I'm going to ask Dr. Albert when he gets back, but I don't think he has a problem with following up on that request. Well, while we're talking about leave, let's just move into 3B, and this is uh, our military leave policy. I think this is a little easier since it's mandated by the federal government. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'll be brief in my remarks. Um, what we have before you today is a proposed amendment to the city's military leave policy. As you may know, Federal and state law both provide certain regulations to employers relative to uh, civilian employment for military service members. So you have USERA, that's the federal law, that's the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, and then you have Georgia Code 38. So these two um, statutes provide us the guidance that we need in order to move forward in how we treat uh, military deployments, military reemployment, and then military leave. And so in reviewing our personnel manual, one of the things that jumped out to me was we didn't allow our policy to become outdated. And so that was a, a concern of ours. And so what we put before you is a policy that has since been updated to reflect the current realities of USERA and Georgia Code 38. Uh, particularly what this revolves around is an increase from 15 days to 18 days for paid military leave, that's the state law, and then also re-employment rights for returning service members, and that's a federal law. So. Uh, like I said, I'll be brief in my remarks. I think that's really the essence of it. Um, the language that you see before you was pulled primarily from you, Sarah, and from Georgia Code, and then it was reviewed by our uh, personnel law attorney. So it's been vetted. Any questions? If you have none, then I'd recommend that this be put on our agenda for a vote tomorrow evening as something that's, that came out of this week. Okay. Thank you. Do that, Mr. Gilmore. I appreciate it. All right, done. Thank you. Item three B six is a parking study proposal. Mr. Smith. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor and Council, you may or may not have been aware of some of the issues surrounding parking downtown currently. <coughs> Perceived or real? Uh, but. For whatever reason, it has become a bit of a, a topic lately with the downtown merchants and property owners. And I know myself and, and a number of other staff members have um, received a, a fair amount of input on that topic lately. Uh, so following up on that, and then following up on some questions from you all uh, not too long ago pertaining to our parking study and whether it was up to date, that type of thing, uh, you have before you for your consideration uh, a proposal from the Middle Georgia Regional Commission to conduct a parking study for us. I, I don't know how familiar you all are with the current parking study, but it was completed in 2018 by the Middle Georgia Regional Commission. I uh, thought they did a very good job on it, very thorough. Uh, they came downtown at different intervals, different times of the day, and did assessments <coughs> pertaining to uh, all, par all, the par all the public parking uh, downtown, identifying all the public parking, and then when it was utilized and when it was not utilized. Uh, the, for me, the large takeaway was even during peak times, like during lunch between 10 and 2, uh, the parking, the public parking was only 46, 48 percent occupied, so less than um, half of it was actually being utilized according to the study. <coughs> so I took that as well, really not a parking issue. Uh, but again, you know, I'll, I'll admit that things are different than they were in 2018. Uh, downtown has grown, and there are uh, a number of new businesses or soon to be new businesses downtown that will drive a lot of vehicular traffic. Um, so 
So for that reason, to make sure that we as a city are operating with this current <coughs> data available to us, uh, that's, that's why I wanted to get this proposal to you all. I, I guess a little bit about the proposal, my apologies. Uh, <coughs> It's a very labor-intensive process to actually do the parking study, so walk around and look at the things, like I said, during different intervals and all that. Uh, they're proposing to be here in the fall. Uh, this is when they can basically have the labor force available. They have a lot of other stuff going on right now, so they could do it during the spring. During the summer, uh, with school being out, it doesn't really represent you know, the, the real I think, traffic that you typically see downtown, like the fall and, and winter and spring might. Uh, so getting them here in the fall, letting them do their assessment, putting it all together, and getting y'all something by the end of the year. But it would also uh, include, I would hope, uh, the opening of some new restaurants, which will add to that parking stress, as well as possibly, you know, more events being held at the news, which would also give us an opportunity to really look at the impact of the new businesses downtown as well. So, so all seems like a reasonable time to do that. Council members? Okay. Do we need to vote on that, Mr. No, if council concurs, we'll just proceed with it. <coughs> yes, I, I think that's a good idea because, like I said, get a lot of feedback on it. It's not enough space to park. It's space where we have food cooked prior. You know what I mean? So that's one of the things that that people are looking at what can we park and the location to park. I think the study would be good and we can find a location that we need to, as people, we accommodate people. As the city grows, we know we're going to have more activity coming downtown. And that's going to be something that going forward, we're going to have to make sure that we can kind of put things in perspective that we're able to apply the park. Like you mentioned, some places might not be with 40%, but then and that might be on a particular time, but then the rest of the time, we might be short of parking. So we need to make sure as we do our study that we can consider that going forward. Yes, sir. Now, please move forward as planned for the fall. I'm sorry? So please move forward as planned for the fall. Yes, sir. Thank you. Dr. Albright, while you were out of the room, there was a discussion relative to amending the annual uh, leave policy. Uh, the other council members agreed to move forward with surveying the employees and getting their feedback and holding uh, feedback sessions so they could discuss with council before you move forward. Are you okay with that? Yes. Thank you. Item four, our council member items. Ms. Byron Grace. Tonight, I was wondering if you might uh, just take a minute and update us on where we're at uh, with the piping out in New Haven and, and Stone Ridge. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, from um, actually, Anthony and I had this discussion earlier today, and um, Piles Plumbing has finished installation of the isolation valves this week. That will, um, in the event that there is a main break or water main break on Stone Bridge, then a very minimal uh, amount of lots will be, uh, I guess, affected because we can isolate out that water and get water to still go into uh, New Haven subdivision uh, from either from Gur Road or from the Sadie Heights subdivision off of King's Chapel. Um, however, um, if there is a, a main break along uh, the main feeding into New Haven that will still affect the New Haven um, residents there. So this is an effort that we put in to reduce the impact of the entire neighborhood where we've had to shut down the neighborhood to fix these main breaks and will we'll greatly help if there is any main breaks. But your circulation is also in places if not? That's correct. So the subdivisions are now looped. Um, but regardless, if there was a main break before, there was there was instances we had to cut it off. Well, I really believe you're going to get great results from the looping factor to take the pressure off those systems. And so I got my fingers crossed that that's the way it's going to work. 
Man, our text, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? And the leafing impacts Sandy Heights, I mean, not, excuse me, uh, New Haven as well? Yes, uh, okay. uh, because it will, the isolation valve will allow the feed, uh, water feed, to come into the New Haven if there's a break east of the line or west of the line, the isolation valves will allow the water to feed through. Okay, and what was the statement you made about if a different main broke, it wouldn't? It there is a main coming from Stonebridge into New Haven. If there's a break on that line, then there's, that still shuts down New Haven subdivision at this time. But the isolation valves are the best option to provide uh, water. To Has that design. line had a lot of issues in the past? No, not recently. It's not been the corporate. The corporate is uh, on Stonebridge. Okay, trail. Is that what's caused the outages in New Haven? Yes, they're 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 connected together. Okay. But being able to isolate those in Stonebridge now. That's correct. Will allow you to still serve New Haven if you have a break over there. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Very good. I just want to get that clarified. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Item five for department head and staff items, Mr. Gilmore. Uh, yes, I have one item and would like to get clarification or a firm, a firm from council. This deals with the COVID policy of the city. Uh, council may remember that there are two, <coughs> in administration's interpretation, two benchmarks that we watch First one are the number of cases in Houston County, and the second and much more major one is the number of hospitalizations that we get in Perry. Um, going through on uh, this most recent uh, Omicron variant that we had, uh, it was obvious that the number of cases and the hospitalizations were dropping. Uh, but uh, had not quite met that number that council had established. However, from the administration standpoint, taking a look at the trends, both in the state of Georgia nationwide and in, the, and in Houston County in particular, it appeared to be appropriate uh, with that positive trend about releasing the mandates we had for masks and those type of things. However, uh, the numbers were not exactly the same as what council had adopted as its policy or its cut point. So uh, I'm requesting from council that they affirm that the administration is allowed to proceed using, based on that data, uh, that we use those as benchmark positions but not absolute numbers. Uh, for example, the difference would be that uh, you may remember the notice went up, go, go back on the process. Every Wednesday or Thursday, you all, as the elected officials and all the department heads, get the numbers relative to COVID. And those numbers determine whether your council policy remains in effect or not. And the remaining in effect in general terms are the mask mandates, uh, signs that are up, so on and so forth. Well, the numbers were dropping, but they weren't quite at that level last Wednesday. But based on my, my understanding uh, of these numbers as benchmark deals and with trends and everything, it appeared that it would be okay. So the COVID policy, council's COVID policy was uh, canceled. Now, if you still want to wear a mask, you could, so on and so forth. Uh, highly likely that when we take a look at the figures this Wednesday, they'll be within the uh, parameters that you already have adopted. And so therefore, uh, we'd like to have council affirm that yes, the administration does have that uh, flexibility, not huge amounts, but that flexibility. You may remember that the basis of our policy uh, that we use in the city is not tied to what the federal government does. It is not tied to the CDC. It's not tied to any other outside group. It is tied to what the hospital situation is in Houston County. 
because that's the item that most affects all our residents. If you have high hospitalization, you cannot get any of the other type of services and there's, there's problems with that. So that's, that's what our basis is. Uh, so I'm just asking if you affirm that that makes sense and we'll proceed that way. Council. Yes, sir. Thank you. It's good to use common sense once in a while. <laughs> well, and, and also I, I think it's important every once in a while to, to go over these things. You know, because they're, they're particularly on such a, sorry, a little soapbox deal coming up here, but particularly on such a major item that affects the nation in so many sectors and so many different ways and so many different positions that people have. Uh, I think it's important for us as Perry to state, here's why we do these things and what they mean. And so therefore, which I think is very important with council's policy is, we're not getting into the issue about whether you are vaccinated or not. We're not getting into the issue about what your religious beliefs are or your concerns as a mother, you know, the, of medical thing, things, all that type of stuff. We are only taking our standpoint on what we do to do two things, maybe three, but definitely two. The first one is to protect our own employees. And as far as I'm concerned, as the manager, I think that's imperative because if we don't, we're going to have major problems delivering our services. We cannot provide, for example, fire protection if we have a whole shift off because of COVID or COVID exposure. The second thing is to protect and take care of our customers. You know, if you're coming in to pay your bills, you know, whatever the case may be, who we deal with out in the public, uh, we do that. Uh, but our basis goes back to the third and maybe the most important thing is relative to what we can do based on documented areas that could affect all our residents and citizens. And that's where we get back to the issue about the hospitalization. Um, so therefore, we don't keep up uh, necessarily with what the tests are, with your pro or con, you know, any of those type of things. You know, we just base it on actual documentation. And if our hospitals that serve Perry are running into problems, you know, because of the COVID, then we do what we can to support our hospital and our citizens. Thank you, sir. And I think you got your agreement from the council. That's that my understanding. We're in good shape. Thank you. Mr. Smith, anything else to see? No, sir. Okay. Ms. Newby? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Ms. King, anything? No, Mr. Worthington? Chief Lynn? No, Chief Parker? Recognize her. Mrs. Pitts? I'm getting it out here. Ms. Warren? No, sir. Okay. Ms. Clark? Yes, sir. Okay. Ms. Harden? Mr. McMurray? Nothing further. Nothing further. You don't have anything to tell Mr. White? Okay. I think that's everybody. I think everybody's had an opportunity. So, is there anything else to come before us this evening? Hearing none, at this time I'll entertain a motion to adjourn until our uh, pre council meeting tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock. So moved. I second. All in the second. Motion to second. All in favor, please indicate the reading right hand. We do stand adjourned.